Okay, should I start? I guess yes. <laughs> um, so um, I will give uh, a blackboard talk. So please, I would I would also like that that's a bit. Uh, so this is a school. So please uh, ask questions and uh, interrupt me if something is not clear or uh, if I'm not saying something that the others didn't ask me about it. <laughs> um, uh, so I would like to um, to talk about about the way uh, that. Um, that, that, that matrix point states can be understood from the point of view of, of manifolds and all the, um, all the applications and different implications that this has for, for simulating many body physics uh, using this manifold picture. So I already kind of touched up on this in my talk on, uh, on Monday, especially in the context of, uh, of these continuous matrix point states. But today I will not talk about these continuous matrix point states. I will just kind of focus on the normal um, uh, matrix product state or TMRG uh, formalism and show that um, many kind of different looking methods for dealing with matrix product states or actually all can all be understood in a unified way once you um, um, look at it from this manifold point of view. So something that, that really bothered me for a long time was was that, uh, just to give an example, is that, that uh, time dependent DMRG this is TDMRG and TEBD. This, these things only work basically if you have homotonies with nearest neighbor interactions. While the DMRG method itself, there was no problem if you had homotonies with long range interactions. Okay? And, and so these, are, these were like things that were not, that felt that this was not right. There was something wrong there. We didn't do it in the right way. And indeed, by, by, by uh, reformulating anything, everything in terms of, of this manifold point of view, you see that you can unify all these things and it will just pop out. It doesn't matter anymore. You can do time evolution with long range interactions basically at the same cost as you would kind of simulate the ground states of a system with long range interactions. So um, I also heard already that many, many people have already introduced matrix product states and, uh, and, and the whole kind of motivation. So I will not do this at all. So uh, um, this is more, I, 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 I kind of uh, uh, believe that you're all kind of already experts now in the field of matrix product states. So, uh, so I will not, uh, um, introduce the, the basic questions because of how uh, I have the feeling that many many people have already done that uh, during the last uh, days and uh, last week uh, for sure. Uh, but again, ask me if something is not uh, is not clear. So what is the the main um, picture that we want to uh, understand? So um, so many body physics. If you look at the the the, the, the uh, the, the history of many body physics, it doesn't matter whether it's, it's statistical physics or quantum many body physics. So all these kind of, the, the many body physics is hard because of the exponential kind of uh, dimensions involved of the underlying space. So it doesn't matter even if you have a classical statistical mechanical model, obviously you also have an exponential kind of size Hilbert space. The quantum case is the same. And um, if you want to do physics, you have to kind of you you have to reduce this. You have to kind of work on some subspace, or you have to identify basically the the relevant um, the, the the relevant states in this whole kind of Hilbert space or phase space that uh, that matter. And uh, in classical statistical physics, this is typically the the Gibbs states. Well, so you're interested in like the just the, the thermal states, the Gibbs states, uh, um, e to the minus beta h somehow, but. Uh, um, and also quantum, these somehow these are like the, the the ones that you're most interested in. And it turns out that that these ground states or, or these Gibbs states they have very special properties. Okay, so so maybe maybe, maybe you're not all familiar with this, but but uh, classically, for example, every Gibbs state, if you have like a Gibbs state of something with a local Hamiltonian, uh, the the so if you look at at somehow the the probability distribution associated to this classical Hamiltonian. Um, the, and you kind of you look at two regions, and the mutual information will actually scale like the area, not like the volume. So, so, so again, these are the, all these kind of things. Always have a classical analog, but you also have a quantum analog, like the area law that people talk about in the quantum case. It's nothing but it's actually exactly the same like the area law in the classical case. And the only difference is classically you have to talk about mutual information, while somehow in the quantum case you have to talk about the fine entropy. Anyway, the the basic premise. Um, but the basic, the basic difficulty is you have this humongous large Hilbert space, okay, or space exponentially large, and you want to do physics with very few kind of the relevant degrees of freedom. Okay, that's the idea of the normalization group, but of anything that is in physics, always you want to reduce these kind of things. Well, the, the basic premise of matrix product states is that for one dimensional um, quantum many body systems with local or quasi local interactions, 
Um, ground states are well approximated by this manifold of matrix product states. Okay, so you have this exponentially large Hilbert space, you have a very low dimensional manifold that captures the ground state physics of many kind of states. Okay, and uh, what you want to do is basically do the physics on the manifold. You don't want to um, do the physics, if you write down wave functions, you really want to parameterize your wave functions with somehow these parameters i. So what you have is psi a i with the a's. So I'm assuming now a translation invariant matrix product state. Somehow the matrix product states are parameterized by these matrices a, and somehow these states, somehow in this large Hilbert space, they kind of form a very low dimensional manifold. And what you want to do is, if, if you do time evolution, you want to describe the physics on that manifold. Okay, so what you say is, if I have a Hamiltonian, so what you want to describe is AH delta over delta T psi is H times psi. So you want to describe the evolution of that state in this Hilbert space. But of course, because you have this variational class or this class of functions that kind of capture the physics well, you want to basically always make sure that you stay on that manifold. So the only thing you have to do is kind of put some projector in front of this. Okay, so if you instead of evolving somehow with your true Hamiltonian, which will take you slightly out of the manifold, you have to project this thing back. Okay, so this you have to take to project this thing back on the manifold and stay somehow on the manifold. So uh, <coughs> for the people that are familiar with Hartley Fock theory, people have done something very similar there. And this kind of methods have been originally devised by Dirac and he called it the time-dependent variational uh, principle. So what he kind of envisioned, Dirac, is that you have like a manifold of slate determinants. Okay, just very simple, well, the simplest kind of fermionic systems that you can imagine. So maybe the product, product wave function, basically. This also forms a manifold in your full Hilbert space. And then somehow he said, well, if we try to do physics now on this thing, why don't we kind of work on the manifold of, 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 of uh, of slate determinants, let's, if you have like evolve with your Hamiltonian, okay, this will involve interactions, will typically create, of course, non Gaussian states, things that are not slate determinants, but you just project them back on that manifold, and then you get this time dependent Hartree Fock equations. Okay, these time dependent Hartree Fock equations are actually non linear functions of your kind of um, non linear differential equations of the parameters of your uh, slate determinant but you stay somehow within the manifold of slate determinants. And here is something very similar. Okay? So what you have is we start from a linear equation in the exponentially large Hilbert space, but now somehow what we will do is project always this thing back on the tangent plane, because if you have a manifold, on every point in the manifold you have a tangent plane. If you project h times psi on that tangent plane, you will stay, the evolution will stay on the manifold. Okay, that's, that's very clear. If you have a curved thing and you have a tangent plane, and you kind of always stay in the tangent plane, you just walk on that manifold, and that's exactly what we want to describe. So what will come out of this is basically that this state will always be describable by matrix product states with some kind of bond dimension A. So what you will get here is a differential equation for your matrices AI. That is nonlinear. Okay, the nonlinearity is only coming there because of this projection back on the manifold. So what you have done here is basically offer linear evolution in an exponentially large Hilbert space. Say, but okay, this is completely impossible. It's linear, so it's very nice, but it's completely impossible to do. Let's kind of instead write down nonlinear differential equations that kind of with respect to the parameters that describe my manifold. Um, but of course, this is a very small kind of dimensional system. So there's no problem no, in dealing with nonlinear differential equations. Actually, it's very interesting if you look in, uh, in physics in general. Okay, so whenever you encounter as many, there's plenty of in statistical physics, non-equilibrium physics, whatever. There's plenty of nonlinear differential equations that you encounter. And then you start kind of basically digging deeper and saying, where do these nonlinearities come from? Because actually, uh, well, even statistical physics, classical statistical physics, should be kind of linear. No? You have the Liouville, everything is linear. How do you get kind of these nonlinear differential equations that you use? In statistical physics, well, it's always kind of be traced back to some kind of very similar thing. Okay, you make an ansatz instead of kind of working with completely general probability distributions on your full phase space, you make an ansatz, typically a product ansatz of your probability distributions. And therefore, you have to, instead of the Liouvillean that becomes linear, you kind of have to project back on that ansatz kind of probability distribution that you make, that you get, and then you get a nonlinear differential equation for some hard you know, kind of thing. And it's very interesting, even Navier-Stokes and all these kind of things can be completely understood within such kind of a framework. 
always you make some kind of some ansatz in which you neglect correlations and all these kind of things, and that's always the origin of nonlinearities. Um, by the way, Grosby-Tajewski equation, that maybe some of you are very familiar, certainly if there's atomic physicist here in the audience, the Grosby-Tajewski equation is also exactly the same thing. Now, what you say is that we have the manifold of basically product kind of, that's a field theory, you know, it's a continuous theory, but it's a product wave function, so all the coherent states are product wave functions. Let kind of, we project always on this thing, and you get here the Grosby-Tajewski equation where these AIs would just be a kind of so-called wave function or the nonlinear sharing equation. Anyway, so the goal is that we understand how to do this. Okay, so it turns out that, of course, DMRG is of that kind. In DMRG, you have like a certain matrix product state, certainly time-dependent DMRG of that kind. It turns out that also kind of the, the normal DMRG method can also be completely understood within this kind of um, framework. Okay, so how do we kind of set this up? Or how can we understand how to, uh, um, how to do this projection? Well, let me just Basically, um, so before I write down this project, because there's a very nice form for this project of a tangent plane, you can explicitly write down what this projector is on the tangent plane. But before we do that, let me kind of remind you of some uh, um, some canonical forms. Okay, so uh, if you have a matrix product state, a general matrix product state, like this, then um, certainly in all the previous talks, you have already seen that there's lots of canonical forms that you can write down. Okay, so for example, you can write this down in such a way, and this is the notation that I will use. Um, um, example this, and then this. Okay, so this, by doing gauge transforms, okay, so a, a matrix product state is not unique. Now you can do all these gauge transforms, and, and, and many people have talked about this in the previous talk. Certainly also yesterday, I think, the talk of Frank Palmer. Um, and by doing gauge transforms, somehow you can modify, you can change these, these matrices into left orthonormal or right orthonormal states. And you can basically choose wherever somehow you kind of put this left orthonormal. So in this notation, everything to the left here is left orthonormal. Everything from the right of this center side is right orthonormal. And somehow this center side is just not kind of. Okay, and there's very simple algorithms um, for kind of converting any matrix product state in such a normal form. Okay, where somehow all these things are left orthogonal, all these ones are right. This is kind of a center side. And this actually also works in a thermodynamic limit. So everything that I will talk about perfectly works if you have an infinite system. Okay, so when somehow the number of spins is infinity. Okay, because that's certainly something that you want to do. Okay, there's actually another kind of way of writing this down, which was also kind of which is also kind of standard. So this goes forever. So instead of kind of writing this center side down, you can actually write it down as again something left orthonormal times somehow another center side, but the center side now without physical leg. And this will exactly kind of contain the singular values of the Schmidt coefficients of your state. Okay, so, uh, so this is just a pictorial. I, can, I don't want to kind of go into too much kind of technical details because it's pretty obvious actually for uh, all of you to see what this is. But somehow the important thing is that. Um, once that somehow you have this relation between this center side, this can be written in this form, but this can also be written. If, uh, I'm talking, sorry, I'm talking now about the thermodynamic limit. So assume now that all these matrices are equal to each other. And let's try to find out what these kind of different things are. So it turns out that this center side kind of can be written in two ways, huh? because this has to be equal to this, but of course it also has to be equal to when I would put this center side there. So this also has to be equal to. Um, <coughs> this kind of thing. Okay, and um, so what you see is that basically this center side here is something like an intertwiner that if kind of, if you have this A left and this is the A right, if you multiply the A left on the right with this kind of ball here, this matrix, and you pull this kind of through this center to, to this A left, you get an A right, and again the center side. So it's an intertwiner that basically flips the gauge of your matrix product state. Okay, and, and actually, uh, for the people that are interested, they, they just have to come to me, I can give you some. So there's extremely efficient ways of giving any transition invariant matrix product state, of basically finding this A left and this kind of center side. Okay, so there's, there's, a, very, there's a very kind of 
very fast ways of converting in the thermodynamic limit any matrix product state into this kind of canonical forms. Anyway, so um, so this kind of canonical forms in this way they are kind of unique up to unity transformations because obviously if you do a unitary here and you dagger somehow on one of these kind of guys, but of course you do your dagger here and you, this again starts for this will kind of remain, keep this thing in the left orthonormal or the right orthonormal form, so this will not change. Yes? Wait, is this very efficient way, does it mean more efficient than diagonalizing the transformation? Uh, yes, it's actually, um, um, let me say that again. So if you take any book on linear algebra and they, um, um, you uh, ask, find the singular value decomposition of a matrix A. Mm -hmm. Then, um, what you say would be, ah, I have this matrix A, let me take A dagger A and calculate the eigenvalue decomposition of that. Okay, and that will give me indeed the left singular vectors, or the right singular vectors. And then I have to calculate the eigenvalue decomposition of A, A dagger, and this will give me the, the, the left singular vectors. But take any book of linear algebra, they say never ever do this. Because you lose an enormous amount of precision. Okay? Because the condition number of this kind of thing is the square of the condition number of this thing. Okay? So this, this is very bad. And somehow these efficient ways that uh, I'm talking about are actually never kind of doing this. So there's, you can actually find this normal, this canonical form, just on the single layer level. Um, in a way that is kind of certainly as efficient as you would do if you kind of would calculate these eigenvalues. But there's much better conditions. And this is important because, again, the singular value, if you look at that, the, the, you're interested in the singular values, no? And if you calculate this by just calculating the left eigenvectors, so well, the singular values are the square roots of these things. But we are exactly interested in the case where these kind of small singular values are, are kind of small. So it's kind of a problematic to take square roots of something small or some, things like that. This, is, this, gives you, this, this, this gives you lots of loss of precision. So it's some kind of QR? It's a QR. So, so what? I can explain that. I would be really glad to explain it. But you can really kind of, kind of, kind of. <coughs> this is a, a tensor version of a QR decomposition. Yeah. Okay. So, so with this in hand, I can now write down what this projector is on a tangent plane. Okay. So again, I have a manifold. I made X product state corresponds with the point in that manifold, and I'm interested now in understanding what the projector is on that map. So, so when you have, a tang you have a tangent plane, well, you have a manifold, something curved, well, you have somehow this plane. This plane forms a linear subspace, and you want to understand how do I project anything on that linear subspace, because that's what you have to do to basically write down your evolution equations. Now, um, as an added benefit, you will see, and this is where I'm also kind of working to, is once you have this projector, and this linear projector on a linear subspace, you can also kind of take the full Hamiltonian and project it on that tangent space, and you will immediately also be able to diagonalize somehow this effective Hamiltonian. This will give rise to an effective Hamiltonian, namely the Hamiltonian as projected on the tangent plane. And you can diagonalize that effective Hamiltonian, this will give you the whole excitation spectrum of your kind of thing. So you will not just get the ground state, but for the same cost, basically, you will immediately have the whole dispersion relation, all the other excitations, elementary particles on top of the vacuum. Yeah, this is actually very cool, and uh, um, not so sure why, uh, uh, why people are not uh, using this, but somehow it's at the same cost. So once you have the ground state, once you have found the ground state of a, of a many-body system uh, using matrix product states, you've kind of, this is a, it's correspond to some extremal point on that manifold, then for this, you can, it doesn't cost anything anymore to basically construct this tangent plane, project the full Hamiltonian on the tangent plane, diagonalize this thing, and you get the full dispersion relation. Okay, um, excuse me. This is a bit dangerous. <coughs> well, no, it's okay. Yeah, this must be better. Okay, so let me just pose it, okay? It took many, many years before we understood what this tangent plane was, okay? So, but once we found it, it's kind of completely obvious. This is all, it's, this is the same with many things in life. Will you, kind of try very hard to find it, and then once you find it, you say, well, could that be so stupid? Because it's so obvious. Um, anyway, this tangent plane um, um, is a sum of many things. So what you want is given any vector, you want to project this somehow on the tangent plane of the, uh, of your okay, before I do that. So what is the tangent plane? So, so 
let's assume for, sim for simplicity that I'm working in a thermodynamic limit. So I have a matrix product state that is a transition invariant, but again, everything that I say here is equally valid in the non-transition invariant case. So I have a state psi of A, which is equal to the sum I1 to IN trace A I1 A I2 times I1. And, oh, and by the way, somehow, I, I didn't say this as a motivation, but of course, um, one of the main reasons why this is kind of important to understand this is that this is the natural way of dealing with this, but also very the natural way of dealing with the higher dimensional variance of matrix product states. Okay, so we really wanted to understand very clear, clearly what happens in 1D, because this is obviously somehow also the way you want to do time evolution and actually optimization in two-dimensional systems. If I, I don't probably have time, we'll probably have no time to, uh, uh, to go to, uh, to some two-dimensional variant of this, but you can actually, the whole story can, and some parts of the whole story can really kind of be, kind of also be done in two dimensions. And for the people that are interested, last week we posted actually a paper where we explained how to do many of these optimization things for perhaps using exactly this kind of manifold. Uh, ID. But anyway, if you have a matrix product state, then assume that all the matrices are equal. And actually, I'm working at thermodynamic limits. So the trace, well, oh, yeah, it's not really a trace, no, it's like from minus infinity to, to plus infinity. So what is a tangent plane? It's just the derivative of this kind of thing with respect to your parameters, A, I, alpha, beta. Okay, so you have a state here. And what is this tangent plane? It's generated by saying, ha, huh, if I vary one of my parameters in my matrix product state a little bit, in what direction do I walk? That's a tangent plane. So it's nothing more than somehow all the vectors that can be obtained by taking the derivative of that state with respect to the parameters in your matrix product state. And because this is a multilinear kind of expression, what you see is that this is nothing more than um, a sum over somehow the. So, so if you take the derivative with respect to A and all these A's are equal to each other, well, then this is a sum of something happening here, plus there, plus there, plus there, and so further. So what you see is that this tangent plane will be a sum of basically n different terms. Okay, so I'm not writing this out. Let me immediately write out what this projector is in terms of this canonical form. Okay, so it turns out that this projector, of course this projector will change depending on where you are on the manifold. No? This is very clear. Okay, but uh, if you write down this projector, what you will get is that this is equal to the sum over all possible state, let's say a site k of something like, um, well, actually, I will not, uh, I will not kind of write too many indices anymore. Minus the sum over k, and I'll have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, so it turns out that this projector consists out of two uh, parts. So this notation, so everything that is to the left is always, I assume that it's in the left canonical form. I don't feel like drawing all these triangles on the blackboard because I will have to do it many more times. So, so everything here on the left is exactly this left orthonormal uh, kind of A left. So the, all these matrices are A left, and A left bar actually and A left. These are the A right bar and A right, this is just an identity, but you have to subtract something, okay, and that's very interesting, the fact that you will have to subtract, and you will see that it's indeed very important that you have to subtract this, because this is, so, um, so again, in this notation, for example, if you take, so what I would have is that something like this is equal to this, okay, so if I take two of these left matrices, then somehow, like what, what Frank yesterday explained, somehow the, being left orthonormal means that somehow the identity is a left eigenvector of the transfer matrix made out by these kind of A's. Okay, so this is the notation that if you have a guy like this and this, if you put the identity on it, you get the identity. Okay, so this turns out to be exact, to be the exact expression of the projector on the tangent plane. So it <coughs> transforms any vector into a vector that is somehow a linear combination of vectors of that kind. Okay, so let's try to um, um, prove that this is a projector. Okay, because for people that have never seen this, and I, I guess nobody has ever seen this actually, uh, this, this looks, looks very strange. So, so here there's really nothing, no? so this is the identity. So, so again, the matrix product state, I turn the left to the left, but somehow if I draw the legs upwards, I have to take the complex conjugate of that. So these are, uh, of course, well, this is the, this is the draw and this is the cat. 
or, or the opposite, I don't know what, what you call it here. It's, it's the opposite side of the world, I don't know. Cats and bras, anyway. Um, um, so you see that this is a pro so why, why is this a projector? Um, so obviously, taking any vector and applying this P on it will indeed kind of put somehow, well, let's, let's, let's indeed put somehow an arbitrary matrix product state on top here. And let's try to see what happens if I do that. So this is an arbitrary matrix product state. It doesn't have to be the ground state at all. So what you see is that this part, so of course this is just the new matrix product. This is the matrix product state here on the point in the tangent plane. So these are all the ALFs. And here somehow this is just this. And this whole thing, so somehow everything above here is basically something that lives now on this one side. So what you see is that you will kind of put all A left, A left, A left. So what this will be an A left, A left, A left, A left. And then some operator, now let's call it X. And then here thing, you will all have A lights, A lights, and things like that. Okay, so you see that indeed this thing will kind of convert any state into something that can be written as a linear combination of states like that. Now the amazing thing is that this is um, uh, a projector. Okay, and why is this a projector? So let's try to understand that indeed if I apply this thing twice, that it doesn't change anything. Okay, and that's actually why you have to subtract this part. And the subtraction of this part will exactly make sure that it's a projector without this subtraction. So what you see is that I have, so somehow I have everything to the left and this is just the identity, everything to the right. But I subtract now something that this thing is also included in the a left. I could actually have done it also in the a right, but it doesn't matter. No, it's a sum of all these terms. So let's see that indeed the square of this thing is, um, um, is again itself. So the important thing is to see that if you take such kind of parts that, so this is sum of n terms. If I kind of multiply something where this side is at side k with something where this thing is at side k prime, you will see that these things will vanish. Okay, so why is this? So let's kind of draw this. Okay, let's kind of take indeed the first one exactly the same like we have here. And let's take for the second one, so this is one, two, three, two, three. And let's take for the second, because I take the product of two of these PTs, so I need the first, this is at side k. Let's take the second one at side k prime. Okay, the k prime is, for example, here. So this would be k prime. And then I have. But I have to subtract also, of course, that kind of guy, because this is a sum of two terms. This one term that I will get in the new projector, I also have to kind of multiply with this term. Okay, and this term will be indeed this one, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 3, 4, and then somehow this. But what you see is, this is the important thing. What you see now is that if I take the product of two of these terms with each other, that in this kind of region, I can completely erase this. Okay, because this comes from minus infinity, or from kind of the boundary. So these things, it's like you put an identity here, and all these things cancel. Okay, so they are all cancel, and therefore this becomes just like this. And the same thing here, they all cancel and just close this. And then you see that this part is exactly equal to this part. Okay, so this thing that you subtracted here, make sure that if you take the product of these kind of two things, that somehow this part will exactly have the same expectation value as this part everywhere at kind of when you kind of multiply this thing with something different. Okay. Anyway, if you don't follow this, it's not important. Okay, this is uh, just a proof that this is a projector, and if you are willing to believe me, then you can just believe me, and that's it. Okay, and that I just kind of sketched you how you prove this, and it has to do with these canonical forms. So it was crucial, of course, that somehow these things were in canonical form. That's how you see that this is a projector. Okay, so this is effectively how you prove it. Along these lines, you kind of just 
work it out in a few lines then and we can indeed prove that this thing times it squared is equal to itself. Okay, so what can we do with this now? So that means we have to go back to this equation. Okay, so I have um, this. So I have a certain matrix product state. Um, let's call it psi. And I have a Hamiltonian working on. Oh, sorry, before I, I do this, something very important is that, of course, something that lives on the tangent plane is not a wave function itself, it's a direction. Okay, so somehow a point on this manifold is a wave function, a derivative of the wave function of manifold is the direction in which you move. And in principle, you could, of course, say, ha, huh, but this is a sum of matrix product states if I take the derivative, so it's also matrix product state. But this is actually completely a misconception. This is not right, okay? From the point of view of physics, this is not a normalized, it's not even a normalizable state in the terminal plane. It's like a plane wave. It's an excitation, okay? So, so that's why, of course, these things that live here will correspond to excitations, okay? Because it's something like a sum of something happening here, plus there, plus there, plus there. It's a wave function. And um, there were, so I don't know whether people have read these papers, but somehow there were quite a few papers uh, in the recent years where people are trying to use, let's say, Chebyshev polynomials for doing time evolution and all these kind of things. Anyway, what they did is effectively try to, read, uh, write, to da write down things in this tangent plane as matrix product states themselves. And this is kind of conceptually not right. This cannot work, this is not scalable. You cannot kind of write down something in a tangent plane as a matrix product state because it's something that lives, it, it, it's a completely different object. Okay? It's something that is not normalized, no, it's a direction in which you want to move. But anyway, so let's kind of uh, look at this. I have a wave function, I have a Hamiltonian acting on this wave function, and this is how I want to change my kind of thing. The Hamiltonian, well, for the moment, it doesn't matter whether it's, I will just represent it as this kind of purple thing. It's, so it, so it can be nearest neighbor, it can be long range, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so what I get is this matrix product state here, and I have my Hamiltonian that is acting like this, and then I have to do this. Okay, so you see that delta over delta t of psi is pt h times psi. And this pt, so this is my wave function, this is my Hamiltonian. And I have to multiply this kind of thing, and I have to take the sum with respect to case. So what you will get here is that this equation, this i h delta over delta t times psi, will be become a sum over k of, let's say, um, 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 let's call it psi k. Okay. The psi k are just this whole kind of expression. This multiplied by this minus this multiplied by this. Okay, so whenever you have a differential equation, yes? I just want to add to the previous one that you said about the Chebyshev polynomial. I think this statement is what you said is for the infinite. It's for finite, it's, it's okay. No, well, yes, it's okay, but it's not scalable. As you will see that the larger the system becomes, the worse. Because so what you what you do with, with Chebyshev polynomials is I have a state psi and you say, aha, let me apply h to psi. And I write it as a matrix, let's approximate this as a matrix product. And then h squared times psi. I write it approximate it as a matrix product. This is not correct. This is this is something the approximation will get worse and worse the larger the system comes, which is not which is not physical, it's not what you want, because somehow in principle, if you have a system with a finite correlation length, you you this, this thing should kind of, it's a local, well, should not get worse if somehow you get kind of longer. And that's why you don't want to do this. What you want to do is something, you will always want to, if you want a state, you want something extensive. Instead of working, let's say, with CI in terms of quantum chemistry, because you're the chemist here, and working with CI, you want to work with coupled cluster. Okay, and that's exactly, instead of CI would be applying H to Psi, which is not size extensive, you want to work with E to the I HD, this is size extensive, and this is kind of the going from CI to coupled cluster, and that's exactly doing time evolution. And indeed, this is the scalable way of kind of dealing with these spectral functions, not doing Chebyshev, but actually by doing time evolution. And that's of course, indeed, people realize this now, and it turns out that you get much better kind of spectral properties by doing time evolution than by doing this Chebyshev. Okay, so um, 
how do we proceed here? So I have now this differential equation, which uh, delta over delta t psi is sum over k of psi of k. So this is a classic problem. Right? If you have a differential equation, um, but, and of course somehow this, uh, instead of this, because this lives in the tangent plane, this is basically kind of telling you how to update, so it immediately kind of reflects to how these AIs move. Right? Because you see that if this is applied to my state, and somehow this whole thing, no, no, so let me kind of, this whole thing is basically delta over delta t a center of side k. Okay, because all these guys are in the left gauge, all these guys are in the right gauge, and there's a con the only connection between some of these things is this line here and this line, so this whole thing is very clear that this is nothing more than the derivative of your center side, maybe this guy here. Okay, so you can immediately read off that this part is exactly how you will update the center side at that kind of place. While this kind of part is exactly delta over delta t c at side k, where the c is this kind of guy. Okay, because indeed all these guys are on the left, all these guys are on the right, so this thing is exactly of this form. And indeed, now it makes complete sense that you have to subtract this kind of thing, that there's a minus sign there. Okay, of course this minus sign there was there to make this a projector. But also physically, what does it mean here now? Is that if I have my state, I apply my full Hamiltonian to it, and I update my one side in the middle. So basically what you're trying to do is, with this one side in the middle, you're kind of updating the full Hamiltonian. Okay, so if I would do this now, because I have a sum over k, I would do this here, 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 and so forth, I would do this on all sides, I would effectively have updated my Hamiltonian n times. So I would have done n time steps. Which is obviously not right, okay? Because I just want to do one time step. But that's exactly what this kind of thing is doing for you. So what you're doing is one step forward with somehow the center side, and then one step backwards with this kind of guy. And again, one step forward with this. And what you see is that actually there's one, this sum goes from one to n minus one. Well, this sum goes from 1 to n. So there's actually one more term here than there. So indeed, if you kind of want to evolve the time with your full kind of thing, you really have to evolve with all your steps. But you will, in total, somehow, the sum of these two will indeed kind of come down to one time step. And this is kind of the extensive way, and this is somehow the part that was always missed. Uh, this kind of thing that you have to subtract is this is somehow the part that we always missed and everybody always missed, and kind of made sure that indeed it was very difficult to do time evolution with systems, let's say, with long-range interactions, because somehow if you update your site with the full Hamiltonian, well, it's obviously not right, because somehow you have to update it. If you update all your sites with the full Hamiltonian, do n time steps and, uh, as opposed to one time step that you actually want to do. Okay. Is, this, is this clear, or I'm only I'm losing you guys? Uh, please ask questions. Oh, I'm, uh, um, Anyway, what you have is now a differential equation, which is a sum of many terms. Okay, so just think about how people do solve differential equations. So the, I think by far the most, um, um, the differential equation that people are most familiar with in physics are like Laplacian kind of problems, you know, like problems with heat conduction, whatever. Now you have like delta over delta t of psi is your Laplacian acting on psi plus some potential acting on psi. Okay, so this is exactly a sum of two terms. So what do you do if you have a differential equation that is a sum of many terms? You use a splitting method. You first evolve with one term and then with the other term. Now it turns out that all the different methods that people have used in matrix product states kind of boil down to different ways of splitting this. Yes? And when you project the Hamiltonian, can it happen that you freeze out certain dynamics that you don't want to treat like. I mean, what I mean is, when we do DMRG, and we might have the problem, like if you have to do DMRG on long-range models, we sometimes need to do mixing, because otherwise the DMRG might not mix in the correct state. Yes. Can this happen here too? Yes, this can happen. And the solution to this is actually just doing this and this. <laughs> It's like the one side versus two sides. Uh, I, 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 you might have to go to n, like really large n for certain long-range models. 
No, no worries. I don't understand. Well, so, so I, I, I thought your question was if you cannot stay on this manifold. But maybe I misunderstood your question. That actually, you have to really increase your bond dimension to, to capture the physics that is going on. And this you can do actually by indeed going to two, two sides here in the middle and one side. This is how you in increase the bond dimension. Okay? Because what I'm describing till now is like the one side DMRG method. But right, this I but I think what I meant, like for example, for this quantum hot system, we yes. have the problem that even though we allow the bond dimension to grow, it would still, by projecting the Hamiltonian, just miss certain things. Where basically, it cannot reach certain states. But you mean because the, the initial state is orthogonal to all these kind of things that you want to get? Because as long as it's not orthogonal, it will be there. So that's, I think, what you're saying is that if your initial state is completely orthogonal to some modes that you want to kind of get with H, then of course you cannot get it. No, that's, 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 that's kind of obvious. But, uh, and because if it's not orthogonal, you will get some contribution of so that. You, but you're saying that like, it always would work, so that would not be a problem to have. Well, unless indeed you, you, there's some quantum number that is orthogonal or something that you cannot capture. No, I, I don't know. The, the, but generically, yes, I would say that this, this, cannot, this should not happen. Okay. What's the mixing that you have to do, then, additionally? Well, if you have like long-range hopping, and it turns out that when you... So, so if you would do this... If I the Hamiltonian exactly, you can go from the state to to the ground state. But if you do this projection, then it turns out that those terms just never really. No, but wait. Come so the, the really important thing here is that, and that's the really difference with TDMRG and all this, is that we always apply the full Hamiltonian to our state and then project it. Only then project it down again to our kind of manifold. And indeed, if you kind of, and that's why somehow it was so hard to kind of deal with systems with long-range interactions for doing time evolution. Okay, because somehow you have many terms. You have a term between acting here and there and so forth. But how do you kind of use these terms in such a way that you exactly use one time step? Because you can use this term for this updating this one, but you could also use this Hamiltonian term for updating this one and this one and this one. And there's something that at, at the end, you, don't, you have no clue where to use which terms for, to update what. And that subtraction is exactly doing this for you. It's exactly making sure that for every update that you do, you have access to the full Hamiltonian, all the terms in your Hamiltonian, not just the local ones. And that was the problem with TDMRG, is that you suddenly just update basically, you only consider terms in your Hamiltonian that are here to update this one, and you don't consider what is happening far away. That's why this is the optimal thing. No? So if you do time evolution, this is really the kind of thing that you want to do. You have a state on the manifold, and you want to walk on the manifold. Okay, and then, and it, it, yeah, it's, it turns out that, of course, this, this reduces to, well, you will see that this is very similar, of course, to, to, to the usual thing, but, but it, 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 the cost of this will be exactly the same as basically the cost of TDMRG, but will kind of be the global optimal solution, not the local optimal solution, which TDMRG is. This is the global optimal solution. Anyway, so what I was saying is that, that typical, if you have a differential equation and you have a sum of many terms that you have to update, because obviously in the translation invariant case, what I have here is delta over delta t a. Well, it will be a sum of basically uh, many terms. I, uh, you have to split. You have to decide. So like with the Laplacian and the potential, you first kind of evolve with the Laplacian, then you evolve with the, the, with the potential, then again Laplacian. You have to always do this splitting kind of thing. No? If you have a differential equation, you always do trotterize. Basically, it's a Suzuki trotter kind of uh, uh, thing of your differential equation, that's what you have to do. So it turns out now that if you have this differential equation, you have to indeed choose how and what order will I kind of update my different tensors. And there is a very natural order, of course, if you look at this picture of how to update your tensors. Namely, what you do is to first evolve, let's say, this center side, then evolve this one backwards, then again go to the next side, evolve this one, evolve this center side backwards, and kind of go from left to right and right to left and sweep like you do in kind of DMRG. You kind of sweep from left to right. Now, you have to choose, of course, if you have a differential equation, you have to choose your time step. And now there's something very remarkable going on. Now you can say, okay, let's kind of try to understand now DMRG in this language because it looks very close to DMRG now, no? Because you update basically your tensors, you go from left to right, from right to left. It looks very much like you update DMRG, although this term is completely not present in DMRG. You never have to go backwards. This is the term that you absolutely need if you do real-time evolution. Okay? Otherwise, you're kind of wrong. You're not kind of doing the right time evolution. But if you 
to find ground states, you don't really care about following your kind of path in the right way. You just care about minimizing the energy. So it turns out that DMRG within this kind of scheme is recovered by choosing, by choosing exactly the time steps or the, 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 the splitting in the way that I say you go from the left to the right. But at every time step, you take delta t equal to plus infinity. Okay, so instead of evolving with an infinitesimal time step, you effectively make delta t infinitely large such that you completely minimize the energy over kind of all your Hamiltonian terms here. And this turns out to be DMRG. So it's using this splitting, the same splitting as you do here, and then somehow instead of evolving with a small time step, you make this time step equal to infinity such that this is kind of minus, such that they're going to the ground. It's an imaginary time evolution with time step mi or minus infinity. Oh, it's, it's extremely strong. So that you freeze the kind of thing in the ground state of this local effective Hamiltonian. So basically, this whole thing is replaced by the thing that minimizes the global energy. That's what you do in DMRG, and this is exactly equivalent to saying, ha, I kind of take an infinite time step. Turns out that if you took this infinite time step, that kind of this thing going backwards doesn't do anything anymore. Okay, because somehow you're in this kind of fixed point. This time step backwards doesn't, well, it's, it's kind of you're in a stationary point. And therefore, indeed, you can completely ignore this. And that's why this term is not present in DMRG. And then you kind of sweep between left and right, and you can go from left to right, and that's how you recover the whole uh, uh, story. So indeed, this is um, effectively how, um, how DMRG then works, or the time evolution of DMRG. So maybe it looks a bit strange and it looks a bit technical, but really, if you sit down and write these equations down and implement them, you will see that it's by far not more complicated than what you do with normal DMRG. And it's actually the optimal thing. Okay, so it's really the it's really this is what you do if you walk on the manifold. Of course, what you have to do now is take a time step, and you have to do this splitting. You kind of go from left to right, right to left, and so further. Uh, and uh, that's how you deal with this. Okay, and these equations, this kind of solutions of this, how you do this, this is called the TDVP method, right? the time dependent variational principle. Okay, because you kind of use the variational principle on the manifold, so it's the optimal kind of following of your trajectory on the manifold. And that's basically how time evolution works. So this is the time. Okay. Um, let me, um, so is this clear or there's some question? Because now I want to kind of, of, uh, of explain how you can use this now to find, to find ground states of transition invariant systems. Are there questions about this? And also I want to explain now how, once you have this formalism, how you can, uh, um, how you can extend this to find actually the, the excitations in your system. Okay, so what you find the ground state, the stationary point on your manifold, how you can access actually the, um, the excitations. So that's another reason why you want to use this kind of method. Because what this method will do, will kind of find really the matrix project <coughs> that is completely translation invariant with the lowest energy on the manifold. And why do you want this matrix product state to be completely translation invariant and not just translation invariant with a period kind of two like you get in TBD? It's because if you're interested now in looking at the excitations, you want momentum to be a good quantum number. You want to have a translation invariant ground state, one that is not kind of invariant under shifting with two sides. Now you really want something that is invariant with shifting with one side, if you kind of want to access now the dispersion relation on top of it. And that kind of this method is giving this to you for free. Yes? But if you just say you have an AB, AB structure that just means that your unit cell is bigger. Yes. I mean, you just have to kind of rescale your momentum then. No, but then two momenta the kind of fall into, the, into each other, no? So you, have, you cannot resolve anymore. You cannot resolve half of the momenta anymore. No, I mean, it's just your, your brilliant zone just becomes smaller. You have to multiply yes, it. Yes, yes, but you cannot distinguish it. Right. Wow. Yeah, brother. Yes. Okay. But then, if you've got a wave function that's two side translational invariant, but actually physically in the state of one side translational invariant, it's quite straightforward just to, 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 to find a gauge that will make it. No, that's not true. Actually, yeah, yeah. It's easy, yeah. yeah it's, it's in principle easy, but if you try to do it, it doesn't really work. Yeah, it does. Sure. I do it myself. Yeah. yeah, well, but, but here you don't even have to do this. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to make a big deal out of this, but, but it's, not, it's not entirely obvious. Given an A-B structure, that is, because it's not exactly translation invariant, because it never exactly converge, and you have to do some optimization there. Because it needs to be. I mean, if you... If you if but again, you will have to kind of find, like, so, so how will you do this? If you have an A-B, you will kind of shift 
the one with one side and you have a BA and then you look at the le leading eigenvectors, the left eigenvector of this and this is the X and this will be kind of the gauge that you have to apply but then you have to apply the X and X minus one and again yeah. this can be, pff, I don't know, it, it, I've, I've done it, I, I, I know how to do it and and it's, well, so, so yeah, I think you also kind of did it for yeah, quite a few times and then there was, it, it always it worked very well. But yeah, it has to be completely converged to work nicely. Yeah. So you have a uh, left and right canonical. So when you say translational invariant, what? So if you have a translation invariant wave function, this is like an infinite system. It's like the, the kind of things that, that uh, Frank was also talking about yesterday. Then, of course, you also have left and right canonical. No? There's, there's like, this is exactly this, this form. Given all these things that are equal, somehow the, uh, there is a way of converting this into canonical. So, so there's, 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 so this, this is a bit strange, no? but this, Tensor, if it's translation invariant, contains as much information as the original one. Okay, so we have tensors that are no gauge at all, many of them, and you can bring them in canonical form, in left canonical form, or in right canonical form. It turns out that this kind of has as much information as the original one. Okay, so this one has as much information as this one, has as much information as this one, although the center side actually has no information whatsoever. Okay, because the, the, this, you would think, how? Ah, this is my full wave function. But that actually doesn't contain information about the full. You don't know how to extend it. So the only ones that are really relevant are these ones and these ones. And then this one is how you, is effectively, how do you kind of connect these two? How do you merge the gauges of these two? Yes, so, so, so this is, up to this point, quite general. And uh, you are going to apply this formation to obtain ground state and uh, extended states and so on. So could you remind me? Um, how so? So you consider the projection to manifold, and how general this manifold can be? So what is the condition for this manifold uh, for this formation to work? Indeed. So that's that's a that's a good question. I didn't really go into this, but the important thing for this manifold for this projector to be smooth, such that it's, there's no discontinuities or kind of no well that 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 there's a smooth thing is exactly this injectivity. The fact that your matrix block state has to be injective. If you're not injective, then this corresponds to singularities on your manifold. And of course, the tangent plane is not well defined anymore if you have singularities. So luckily enough, if you kind of do matrix block state calculations, you almost always remain injective. Although, this is what we talked about yesterday in your talk, now, there can be cases in which you lose injectivity, and then that's a problem. You really have to kind of fight this, and because somehow your your methods will not not work anymore, no? Because you you have to like you have to find this left eigenvector in your kind of formulation. You always have to find the left eigenvector of your transfer matrix, and this left eigenvector will not full, be full rank anymore. But in your formulation, you have to invert that thing. Okay, and then of course you kind of something goes wrong. Something that's very important also in this formulation: you never have to take any inverses, nowhere. There's not a single inverse of anything anywhere. And that's what is very disturbing with, uh, um, with the, the, the TBD in the thermodynamic limit. So if you have a transition invariant case and you do the normal TBD, you actually have to take inverses of your Schmidt numbers, which is completely unnatural. You don't want to do this. You don't need to do this. Yes. No. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, but in, in, yeah. the, in, in the simplest, in the most simplistic way, yes, and in the, in the, in the code that you showed yesterday, you had to do it. In, well, this was a toy code, but I mean, it's like basically just changing two lines, it just, you don't... <laughs> 20 lines. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're just basically... Like no, no, but it's, it's, it's clear. It's, it's, it's clear to me that you don't have to do this, but, but it's, nevertheless, this is like a school, it's important to say this, that you want to have codes in which you never have to write inverses. You don't no, want I, I to I have inverses at all. And you certainly didn't no, do that. This is not true for <laughs> TBD. It's just basically the most intuitive way to write it down. You do this because it's just simple. But basically, instead of multiplying with the inverse, you can just construct this theta and all yeah, but I, look, I, I don't. So here also, you don't have to take inverses at all. No? And it's very clear that if you do it right, you will never have to take inverses. So it doesn't matter in what kind of method you do it, you will never have to take inverses. Okay? That's, and you don't want to take inverses. But um, um, certainly in this uh, manifold picture, this is not obvious. Okay? And that's why somehow we have to kind of go through this. It turns out that actually the inspiration for all this was, uh, um, was in words that a guy called Lubich did. So Lubich is a famous... Um, 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 applied mathematician um, that had been working on very similar issues, but not on matrix product states, but actually on how to update low rank approximations, like 
if you have a single invalid decomposition of a matrix that is low rank, and you have new information that is coming in, and you want to update your single invalid decomposition, um, um, how to do this in an optimal way, your single invalid decomposition, you um, naively would have to kind of take the inverses of the singular values. And this is not something you want because it's exactly when these small singular values are the ones that don't really matter anyway. So you don't want to take inverses. So what Lubig did, and this is a very famous paper, he um, uh, proved that indeed there is a way of updating somehow the singular value decomposition with a very low rank kind of thing. There's a way of updating this low rank um, um, singular value decomposition without ever taking inverses. Okay, and it turns out that what we do here is exactly somehow the matrix product version of what he did. And the trick that he invented was exactly kind of to evolve forward, then backwards, and then again forward. Okay, and this is exactly kind of present in this thing. So it's not, so it's not entirely um, obvious that indeed these inverse, that you can do these things inverse free, and this is kind of based on this paper of Lubick. And this is uh, very useful. Huh? This is exactly what people like uh, do. And if you update the Google matrix, okay, this is a very low. You have a very low dimensional. Like, version of your kind of Google matrix and you have new information, you have to update your singular values. How do you update them without taking inverse of the singular values? That's exactly what kind of is done in this, uh, in this framework. Okay, so let's, um, let's move and um, um, basically show how to, uh, um, how to turn this now. Because in principle, what I said here is not really um, an algorithm yet for uh, the thermodynamic limit. Okay, so because why is this not working in the thermodynamic grid? Because somehow if you update and you walk from left to right and right to left, so obviously these things are not incompatible anymore. You update, let's say, some matrices A. But by doing this, the ones to the right of it are not kind of compatible anymore with the ones that you updated. So you don't, you leave basically the translation invariant manifold. Okay, so the question is how do you do this? Or how can you deal with this formalism without leaving the translation invariant manifold? And, um, Um, and um, the result of so what I will explain you now um, um, is equally valid also when you don't work with Hamiltonians, when you're kind of not interested. Let's say I want to find the ground state of Hamiltonian using this kind of formulas now. Okay, given Hamiltonian, kind of find a good way of finding the ground state. Um, as you saw, somehow the fact that this H is local or non-local didn't matter at all. Okay, because somehow this tangent plane did kind of this thing for you. Now it makes sure that you turn something non-local into a local uh, problem. So it turns out that this is also this also works for matrix product operators. Okay, and this is uh, a big problem in all this kind of, of PEPS algorithms, that the generalizations of these uh, of these MPS algorithms to higher dimensions. Um, what you encounter, and I will talk more much more about this tomorrow, is that you have to find you have to diagonalize matrix product operators. Okay, these are transfer matrices in classical statistic physics. I think um, Tomotoshi will also talk about this now to, um, on, on, on Friday. So given a transfer matrix, find the leading eigenvectors of these transfer matrices. Turns out that this is the kind of bottleneck problem in, uh, in all these PEPS algorithms. It's not the bottleneck. We know how to deal with it. Nevertheless, it's certainly the most costly part in all these algorithms. So given a matrix product operator, find the leading eigenvectors. Turns out that this problem is very similar to the problem of finding ground states of Hamiltonians. Okay, and what they will talk about now is actually doesn't matter. It, it, it's the same. It's, you can can see that that, that these problems um, um, are exactly kind of the same uh, issue. Okay, so let's then take the matrix product operator and let's try to um, basically update our matrix product state. So what do we have? So we want to do something in so, so so we put so we want to update let's say this center side. <coughs> um, but what was very clear from this formulation that we had before, we could also just update this guy that is living in the middle of the center. So we had a center side with an external leg, but we also had a center side without an external leg. Okay, and if you do um, the TDVP equations or the DMRG, you always have to kind of evolve with this one and backwards with this one and again forward with this one and so further. Um, so so the, the issue now in the thermodynamic limit is to choose these updates in such a way that they are consistent. Okay, that, that indeed 
that if I update this one, and then this one, and then again this one, that the next step I would exactly get the same equation as I had before, so that I would kind of get a translation invariant description if I would kind of move from left to right. So you want to kind of write down a self-consistent equation for how to update your uh, um, uh, your tensors, okay? And um, um, and uh, so what I'm telling you is that it's really the state of uh, this really by far the best way of finding leading eigenvectors of matrix product operators. You just have to want to know more, like Valentin Zander, to the PhD student of mine, is like the specialist in and doing all this. He can even give you code for uh, uh, for for doing this. But um, so what do you do? Is like you have a matrix product state, and you want to minimize, let's say, the um, <coughs> You want to, to, to maximize somehow, you want to find the leading eigenvector or the lowest eigenvector, depending on whether it's a matrix product operator or a Hamiltonian of this kind of MPO. Okay, so you have an MPO and you want to kind of maximize the uh, uh, expectation value. So what you can do is basically say, huh, I have all these things in the left gauge. Okay, you always use these kind of left gauges and the right gauges because that's important uh, to do it in a, uh, in a consistent way. Um, you say, aha, let me kind of play this trick that I put before. I put A left here, and I leave this leg open. I put my A right here, and I leave these legs open. And if I would have a fixed point, so what you want to do now is write down the consistency equations. That if you have a stationary point of, on your manifold, then these matrices will have to satisfy some consistency equation. Namely, if I update this one, this one has to be optimal with respect to something, and this one has to also be optimal with respect to some other criterion, and they have to lead again to exactly the same original problem. Okay, so if you are in a stationary point, and you kind of put all these A-lefts here, all these A-rights here, and you want to maximize or find the leading eigenvector of this matrix product operator, then basically this amounts to solving the following eigenvalue problem. I, if you, you leave this kind of thing open, you put this MPO here, and the A-lefts there, the A-rights here, so you basically want to find a vector that you have to put here, such that this is an eigenvalue or an eigenvector of this whole problem. Okay, so it's you because you put somehow you put the bra here. So what you have is something where, where this is a matrix problem where this is the right indices, these are the left indices, and you want to optimize basically the center side with respect. So you want to maximize the, somehow the eigenvalue of this matrix product operator while you just want to find the leading eigenvector of this local problem. And this is of course something that you can put in long shots. No? This is like a problem that is not very high dimension, like this is, has d kind of, or high, I don't know, that doesn't does matter how you kind of look at it. But this is like a d squared by d matrix times a d, sorry, d times d squared times d times d squared problem. And of course you can find such a problem very easily using somehow a long shots <coughs> description. Okay. So what you do is, we want to find the consistency equation. We want to see that if I'm in a stationary point, what do these kind of matrices, A left, A right, and A center, what kind of equations have to, they have, do they have to satisfy? Well, it's clear that this A center, if it's, a, if it's an extremal point, has to be exactly the leading eigenvector of that matrix. Okay, so that means that out of this, you can find basically what this A C is. Of course, you could also have kind of put all these A lefts here and the A rights here. And just say, okay, let's optimize basically my center side, something that has no physical leg. Okay, so do the same thing. You open this thing here. You kind of put again the A left here, the A right here. You kind of look for a stationary point because if it's the maximum eigenvector, this thing has to be such that it's the leading eigenvector of that equation, and that means that you actually find the optimal C. Okay, and now once you have A C and C. We know exactly how to deduce the A left and the A right, so we know exactly how to deduce the full matrix product state that is compatible with this and this, because this has to be equal to A left <coughs> times C, but also has to be equal to C times A right. Whereas A left and A right are isometries. <coughs> and this is now a very simple problem, okay, because I'm giving A C and C, and you say, huh, let me kind of optimize. This is like the problem. Give a matrix A minus uh, a unitary times a matrix B. Minimize the norm of this. It's well known how to solve this. Huh? So given the matrix A, find the optimal unitary so that U minus U, A minus U times B is minimized 
Well, what you have to do is take A times a B dagger, calculate the single invalid decomposition of A times B dagger, let's say A1, sigma 1, V1 dagger, and then you have to throw away the sigma so you just put it equal to the identity. And that turns out to be the optimal U that minimizes this norm. Okay, so this is how out of AC and C you deduce a new A left. Of course, you can do exactly the same for the A right. This is how you can, out of AC and C, you get an A left and A right. You plug this in, this thing again, and now you do this recursively. And this turns out to converge extremely fast. So unlike, so this is not, so this is the condition for kind of a stationary point. For a stationary point, this con this, these equations have to be satisfied. What you do now is you start with a completely random initial point and just run this recursively. And what you see is that actually this thing will converge very fast to a stationary solution, which is exactly somehow the fixed point of that equation. Okay, and this converges much, much faster than if you would do just time evolution, if you would do TBD and all this. This is like a quadratically faster converging kind of thing than the normal TBD. But if you were only to do the left one and then a QR decomposition to shift. No, that's also perfectly okay, sure. That would be as good as this. No, no, sure. It's actually better if what. We are not completely out yet. What is, you can do both. It doesn't really matter. Okay. So, of course, you get, you get an A left and then you want. So, so you can, then you can do this algorithm that I didn't talk about yet, but somehow to get a, given an A left, it's very easy to get an A right. All the information is in left. No, that's the only, so all the information about A, C, and C is in A left and some sense. No, A left is the only thing you need. And therefore, given an A left, you can deduce an A right and then just plug it in again and do it. Sorry? This is a single-side DMRG. No, this is not single-side DMRG. Well, this is how I do single-side DMRG. What do you mean? But um, doing lunches on one side, doing a QR decomposition to shift it to the next side, doing lunches and so on. No, 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 this is not. No, no, but this is a translational variance. The QR, you have to watch out that you're in the correct gauge, and also it's not the, the optimal way of solving this equation to minimize this. This is actually better than doing So that. you do the QR actually in that case where this is not well conditioned anymore? Uh -huh. I mean, it has to do again with squaring of similar values and stuff. At some point, you should. No, but this is okay. No, no, it is actually okay to do QR. This is uh, this is perfectly okay. So, um, so what you can do? Well, but, but let's talk about yeah, the details later. Details. But somehow you, uh, so maybe you can provide some. If, if people are interested, just go to Valentin and he will give you some some MATLAB code that, that that does all this. And it's very it's very simple. It's very simple, and it's by far the most robust way of finding. Uh, eigenvectors uh, for translation environment matrix product operators, which is basically the basic, this is the central building block that you need in uh, um, um, in PEPS algorithms. Okay. Let's, um, um, so this is how you find fixed points. And uh, this converges quick and you find indeed the fixed point of your uh, um, let's say matrix product operator or your Hamiltonian, it doesn't really matter. You find somehow the stationary point <coughs> of your manifold. And the next thing you want to do is once you have found this, you want to, uh, um, <coughs> you want to um, um, look at excitations. Okay? Because that's somehow, once you found the vacuum, of course, in principle the physics still has to start. Right? So what you have done here is this kind of a way of finding basically the vacuum of your theory. But at the end, you want to know how your vacuum responds on Petr-B, on, on, on excitations, on disturbances, on what to linear response theory, and all these kind of things. And a very natural way of doing this is indeed by doing the physics now, not anymore on the manifold, but just on the tangent plane of your manifold. So let's try to, to do this. <coughs> okay, so... Um, what you want to do is effectively so find uh, just give it like given given um, um, uh, as an example. Um, let's look at the spin one. So this is like the the most uh, the simplest kind of example of, of a gap spin chain for which uh, you're interested in dispersion relation. Uh, when <coughs> something interesting can happen. Okay, so I have a spin one Heisenberg Hamilton, some I S I times S I plus one. Okay, it's actually in the same uh, same phase as the AKLT model, the spin one AKLT model. And uh, you could ask, okay, what, are, what is the dispersion relation? What is the gap of this thing? What is the, what is the physics above the ground state? So you use these methods to find the ground state, and then you can basically plot 
uh, the dispersion <coughs> relation or somehow the excitation spectrum of your model. And how does it look like in this particular case? Well, because your, um, your system is translation invariant, you can of course label your uh, excitations with a momentum. A momentum is a good quantum number. And uh, you kind of just want to plot basically the energy of your excitations as a function of uh, momentum. Okay, this is nothing more than a label of your eigenvectors. The lowest eigen the eigenvectors, the lowest eigenvectors that are orthogonal to somehow the ground state in a given momentum sector. Okay, and how does this look like in the case of uh, of the EGLT? Well, actually, your dispersion relation looks something like this. So it turns out that you have a minimum exactly when your momentum k okay, is equal to pi, and this is exactly the holding gap. Okay, so this point here, this distance turns out to be the halving gap. An interesting, um, if you kind of look at, so this is momentum pi, exactly at momentum 2 delta, um, what you get is something like this, and then this, this goes down, and your spectrum looks like this. So, so you have this isolated branch, and at some point this isolated branch is absorbed into the continuum of eigenstates, and this continuum of eigenstates is nothing more than scattering states of yeah, like your one particle excitations. Okay, so a one particle excitation is nothing more well, than this. So these are like the particles, and if you're, if you're a quantum field theory guy, then somehow these are the elementary particles of your system. And it turns out that if you have an infinite system and you have a particle, then of course if you have two particles, something at minus infinity and something at plus infinity with the momentum k1 and k2, well, the, 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 the momentum of this combined kind of the sum of these two will just be the sum of the momentum. And the energy will be just the sum of the two energies. And that's why this is exactly two delta. So this point here would consist as exactly two particles with kind of momentum pi. Okay, so there's one there, one there. And of course, in an, in an infinite system, these two particles never see each other. The probability that they're close to each other is kind of going to zero. And that's why there's no, well, that the energy is just exactly two delta. And you're interested in understanding this dispersion relation. Okay, this is the first step. Of course, you're also interested in kind of calculating structure factors and dynamical correlation function and all this, but this is certainly the, the, out of this you will be able to deduce lots of this, this, uh, uh, this, this, this information. Okay, but let's uh, uh, for the moment try to understand uh, what uh, this is. So, um, I will not really go to this, but somehow we, uh, um, uh, we try to understand uh, the nature, we, 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 we did some kind of really non-trivial theoretical um, investigations of how particles, how these particle wave functions look like. And it turns out that if you have a gap system, um, so you have a gap system, let's say, with a big you know, something, that um, you can prove rigorously that these excitations on top of the vacuum, these lowest energy excitations, can always be made as superpositions by acting with an operator, let's say, on these sides, plus e to the ik acting on these sides, plus e to the ik acting on the next sides, and so forth. It's very similar to somehow a plane wave ansatz, but in which somehow the operators that act on your vacuum are acting over somehow a number of sites. And the number of sites you have to act on is actually related not to the gap of your system, but to the gap above somehow your dispersion relation. So the smaller somehow this gap is, like here this gap is very small between your single line dispersion and the second line, somehow these operators have to kind of will have a pretty large extension. Okay, so you can actually prove that indeed the right way of understanding these excitations is exactly somehow by something local, but locality is related to the gap not below but above the dispersion rate. So it's, the, it's, the, it's the gap between somehow your single particle, your isolated branch, and the continuum branch above it. Anyway, so if you look at this then, indeed that's exactly the this, this, this sum of local terms that you have is exactly somehow how these particles can be described. That's exactly how the tangent plane was defined. The tangent plane was defined as basically taking the derivative of your state with respect to your parameters. Okay, and that's exactly a sum of something happening here and there and there and so further. But the advantage of using this um, uh, tangent plane thing is that, of course, if you modify, so, what, if, so we have all these kind of a's now. Okay, so let's go a left, a left. Let's put somehow something like this, a right, a right. And so further. And let's take a superposition. This is at side k over k. E to well, maybe I should call it n. At n e to the i k n times this. 
So what we have now is that if you take all kind of things in your ground state, so these ALFs are just the tensor of your ground state, and then you put an arbitrary operator B, an arbitrary tensor B, and then all kind of operators A right, which are in the ground state, and you take a superposition of all these things, well, obviously, anything that is in this tangent plane is exactly of that form. And if you put a tensor, a, a matrix B here, then in some sense, this B has an effect over the correlation length of your initial system. So you have an original system, your matrix product state, which is a correlation length. And if you put some operator here that is not equal to basically to the, to the A's of the ground state, this will have an influence over the correlation length in your system. And therefore, this will indeed be able to mimic exactly somehow this feature that we had, namely that, that somehow these states, these excitations, can be understood as acting with local operators on your kind of ground set and a sum of something like this. So that is exactly well captured by this. The only kind of disadvantage of this, but this is somehow well in practice, it turns out that this doesn't really matter, is that this has to do with the gap. Somehow the, the effect of this thing, if you put a B there, this has an effect over somehow a distance that is related to the correlation length uh, that is related to the gap below it and not above it. But of course, at the end, you are mainly interested in somehow the lowest lying excitations anyway, and therefore it does not really matter, and that's why this will work. So what we will do now is basically kind of say this is my state psi of B with momentum K. Okay? So I take a superposition of these kind of things, give it a momentum, because somehow why do I give an E to the I K N here? Because somehow if I shift this thing with one side, obviously I take a phase K, and this is exactly the momentum of your Lattice, no? So this is, a, this is kind of the, the, the discrete analog of, uh, uh, of your momentum. Okay? So, so, so and this ansatz, this kind of wave function that you write here, is exactly somehow something that lives um, on, on the tangent plane, but has exactly momentum k. Okay? And you see that this wave function, the parameters in this wave function are linear in somehow b. Okay? This forms a linear subspace, but that's obvious because somehow your tangent plane forms a linear subspace. So how do you kind of find now this lowest energies? I have my Hamiltonian. What you kind of want to do is diagonalize psi k of b prime. Okay, so you take your Hamiltonian. So just a question. If you've got different tensors on the left and the right, so the a and a are two different to a's right, then what does it mean to put a momentum in on the left? No, it's a, the, no but they are, they are related by a no? This is... This, this is, this A right, so nothing more than, so of course this A right has to be compatible with A left. Oh, sorry, right, okay, so this is not a topological. It's not a topological. Oh, okay, right. No, no, indeed, okay, okay so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so, indeed, on, on Monday what I talked, what I explained is that actually there are systems, if you have symmetry breaking, then the, term, the elementary excitations somehow will be such that this A left are actually different than the A right. Okay, maybe you have to apply your symmetry operator to them. And then actually momentum has no meaning whatsoever. It's only a relative kind of text. So, it's, it's a, so momentum for a domain wall is not defined. Okay? That doesn't have any meaning. But what is still well defined is somehow a relative type of momentum. So that if you change k, you can kind of look at the relative things. So this is something with a certain momentum. This is something with another momentum. Well, the difference of these momenta has a meaning. Okay? And that's basically just shifting. So the only thing that has no meaning is that you can shift this axis like you want. But, but still, the, the shape of it, and, and, but from a physics point of view, there's always kind of a good choice. You can just intuitively see how this is kind of a good choice of where I put my origin if you have topological non trivial excitations. Yes? So can I understand this process as some kind of a single mode approximation? Yes, yes. The, and so the single mode approximation would be if you put exactly the A center here and then put an operator here. Okay, so single mode approximation is clearly, this is a, clearly a special case of this, but this is much better. This kind of is really has much more variational parameters than just a single mode approximation. Yes, but, but, but this is, no, this is, the, this is, the, this is like this Feynman Bile answer. This is the Feynman Bile answer. So now when you have your kind of ground state and you apply a superposition of operators actually there plus there with a certain momentum, well, this is certainly belongs to that subspace, but it's clearly not as general. If you put the general operator B here, then it's much more general. And actually, um, I, should, um, I should have s uh, said this, Ostlund and Rummer had actually already, so in their paper on matrix product states, they also looked at excitations. And what they used as an excitation is something like this, where they put a left here, and they put a center, and they actually vary this center block. 
not these kind of things. And actually, you miss excitations with this. This is not, so this is only kind of projecting on the subspace of your uh, manifold. And it's clear that somehow there are things that are not working. So there's excitations that you miss. Then you don't get the full, you don't get the right dispersion relation in some cases. So it's a, you really want to kind of project this thing on the full tangent plane, not just on the tangent plane like Ostland and Remmer did it actually. And it's kind of a subtle thing and has to do with the dimensions of this, of this, of this manifold. That, uh, yes? So earlier you, uh, you made the point that you have to watch out that these elements of the tangent space, they are not states, they're just directions along which you yes. move. But now we're kind of approximating really excite, no, excite indeed, states indeed. within the tangent plane. Indeed, so and, and we know this very well. How that do you connect this? You, we know that plane waves are not normalizable. Right. Okay, so even in single particle quantum mechanics, a plane wave is not a normalizable wave function. So in some sense, it's not something that lives in the Hilbert space. And that means that indeed the ground state is of a completely different nature than an excitation. An excitation is indeed a one particle, and it's a non. This wave function is not normalizable, no, because it's a sum of infinitely many different terms. Okay, so so but it's, it has the same kind of feature as a, as a plane wave. A plane wave is somehow it's kind of a strange beast, no? It's like a superposition of something being. It's not the normalizable thing. Nevertheless, this is the right way of looking at particles. Yeah, but it's a good good question. Is it related to the fact that in in the ground state you basically have if you would look at the energy expectation value, it would of course be extensive, so diverge, so you have like an energy density. But for an excitation, it has like the difference of the energy with respect to the ground state is like an order one thing. So it would, the, the total energy would still be extensive, but it differs from the extent of ground state energy by order one term. Yeah. So is this the reason for it? Yeah. But anyway, so um, let's, because it's almost time now, so let's, uh, let's try to see what happens. So I have, why, why did I put A left here and A right there? Um, I did this because, of course, in this variational wave, now we have this kind of project on the tangent plane. So we have KB, B prime, psi K, B. So these are just, you just take a vector space spanning all these variables, now, and these are these B, B primes and Bs. But if you take a left here and a right here, it turns out that this thing is nothing more than a trace of B prime times B, or somehow, well, just the, the, the overlap between these two things. This is, turns out that this is exactly B prime B, if you kind of just order all these elements in a vector. And therefore, this is not a generalized eigenvalue problem, but a normal general eigenvalue problem. And therefore, you don't have to take inverses again. So it has to do again, you always want to work in the right gauge such that somehow these things don't bother you. And that's why you have to put a left here, a right there, and then a B. And anyway, so what you see is that you now have just a linear problem. Okay, so, so for any kind of H, somehow you have to calculate basically what this overlap is. And um, um, maybe, uh, do I have to stop or should I, should I do so this? K can be continuous? K is continuous now because we are working at thermodynamic limit. So K is any, any parameter. And that's, that's the really nice thing that we have an extremely good resolution of this kind of thing. If you do exact diagonalization, you only have like typically a few points there, no? namely related to how, <coughs> how precise your kind of thing is. Here we have this complete continuum and you have the perfect resolution of, uh, uh, of, your, of your dispersion relations. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of what happens now, if you do this for the spin one Heisenberg model and uh, you use somehow for your ground state a bond dimension let's say in the order of 100, then uh, you can cal calculate the holding gap with 12 digits of precision. Which is much, much more than you can get with any other method. Okay, normal DMRG and all this don't get 12 digits. You don't know, really that, that does. So this, this really kind of works, okay? So it really gives you an incredible precision at basically no cost whatsoever. Because once you have the ground state, to kind of calculate this is very simple. There's nothing really that you have to do. So, so the only thing that I have to explain basically to uh, uh, to do this is now because this is not a, this is just an angular problem is is how you calculate these matrix elements and this kind of term. Okay, so what happens is that you have to well it's it's kind of easy to see now. So what you will have is let's say Hamiltonian. Let's let's do it for a Hamiltonian. Okay, so you have a Hamiltonian term somewhere. The Hamiltonian is a sum of many terms. Then I have like a tangent plane here. So let's assume that the B is here somewhere. And then somehow let's see that the other V might actually be here. Okay, so this matrix elements would be to put a B here and the B prime there, and this kind of going to minus infinity. And you have to basically sum this thing over all possible length. So this is like this distance is let's say n1, 
this distance is m2, and you basically have to take the sum over all these things. And of course, the phase difference, because this has, will have something like an e to the i k times m1 times e to the minus i k times m2. Well, let me ask a question. Uh, do, we ex do we have to include the phase factor in the definition of this wave function? I mean, here. Do we have something here? I mean, actually, I didn't. e to the i k m. Oh, e to the i k. So the summation is taken over n. N is the position of b. Yeah. Okay, I see. Yes. Well, anyway, um, yeah. Just if you're interested in this, you can read the paper or, or just ask me. But it's 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 pretty straightforward actually to uh, to to make to calculate these matrix elements and take the sum of all these things in an efficient way in such a way that at the end you can use again long shows to kind of give an auditorium to kind of effectively diagonalize this, you can again do this using, using lung shows and you immediately kind of recover all these, um, uh, these excitations. Of course, this is only the, um, so you have to be a little bit careful if, if, if you have symmetry breaking. So if you have a system that has symmetry breaking, then we know that the elementary excitations will not be given by this kind of thing, but you have to put these tildes there. No? So let's say if you have a ground state degeneracy, then a matrix proxy state algorithm will kind of take one ground state out of it, but you know that you have symmetry breaking, that if you apply your symmetry operator to it, somehow this will kind of give you the other ground state. And that's exactly what you want to do here. Like saying that if you have a Z2 kind of symmetry, then you would somehow put the Zs here to the left. And this is basically this, on the left hand side, this, this would kind of correspond to a domain wall. And of course you have to be careful to put the right Zs here. But, but this is all, it's all kind of pretty straightforward and, and there's, no, there's no kind of technical uh, difficulties there. The really interesting thing is actually that uh, once you have this thing, you can of course say, why just limit ourselves to one particle excitations? Okay? The really interesting information, of course, for kind of making effective field theories now, is how these particles scatter with each other. <coughs> so, and what would be a scattering ansatz? Well, you do something very similar, but you put two b's here. You put a b here and a b there. Okay, so this would be a b1 and a b2. And then give, of course, e to the i k n times n1 plus k2 times n2. And you can make the ansatz with two particles. And now you can, again, try to diagonalize somehow this wave function that depends now on two parameters, b1, b2, and k1, k2. And you can do two particle physics. So you can start doing scattering theory. You can like, try to understand how did these two particles scatter with each other. And uh, so I have a very smart student, uh, Lorenz van der Straten uh, is his name. And um, he worked this out completely how to kind of solve this problem. So given having solved this one particle, so you basically get the one particle energies. Now you want to know basically how particles scatter, how they interact with each other. Okay? And certainly for non-integrable systems, this is an extremely interesting quantity. This is like doing, calculating the S matrix of your theory. Okay, and you can basically go to very similar arguments like we have gone through here. And it's a bit more involved in the calculation of these matrix elements because you have two Bs. Now you have like a B and a B and another B and another one. But can, all these things can still be done efficiently. Okay, and out of this, you will be able to effectively calculate the scattering matrix of how kind of two particles scatter with each other. And what is this scattering matrix? It's nothing more than I have a particle one and I have, I have my particle 1 and a particle 2, and I have the superposition, but sometimes the particle 2 is to the left of particle 1, and sometimes not. And this E, this S, is exactly the phase difference between these two cases, when one is to the left of it, or the other one is to the right of it. And you can calculate this phase actually very efficiently using exactly, doing some exact kind of scattering problem with two particles, and out of this S matrix, you can now really deduce lots of properties. You can start, um, 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 we can really start uh, doing kind of field theory now with your quasi-particle excitations. And if you look at how people do condensed matter physics, that's exactly what is done. Huh? So, so what do matrix product state algorithms do? They find the vacuum. Okay, this is like typically the starting point in a condensed matter kind of calculation. Now you have some Hamiltonian for which you have the exact ground state, and let's assume that indeed we have like a ground state, like this for the spin one Heisenberg model, we have the exact ground state. But typically, when is the really interesting physics kind of starting for this model? If you, for example, add uh, a magnetic field, okay, let's say in the sigma z direction with some kind of a b. 
<coughs> and if this B field becomes equal to the gap, then you have this complete condensation of, uh, of your magnets. Okay, you will have this Bose-Einstein condensation of magnets. But now, because somehow we know exactly how the magnets interact with each other, and we know how to calculate the one-particle dispersion relations, we can plug this in into some kind of an effective field theory. Okay? Because the S-matrix basically tells you what the interaction is. The one-particle dispersion relation gives you the one-body kind of physics. This gives you the two-body physics. And you can now just start doing field theory with your magnets. And deduce, for example, what the magnetization of this kind of thing will be as a function of B. Now, um, the most precise way of doing this is actually plugging these numbers into the beta ansatz. Okay, because it turns out that if you have the one particle dispersion relations and you have the scattering information about two particles, this is exactly the input that you need for doing many body physics with the beta ansatz. And if you do this and you plot basically the magnetization as a function of B, you will see that somehow this reproduces uh, the physics extremely well up to all possible corrections that you will not have if you do the naive kind of uh, field theoretic kind of uh, uh, calculations. Okay? So, so, so this is the kind of things that you can start doing. Huh? So you can really, by just solving the model at the Heisenberg point, you can start predicting what will happen if you add a kind of a magnetic field, because you can start doing many body physics with the excitations on top of the vacuum. And I think that's opening up somehow a whole new way of doing physics. Now you can now start as matrix product state now kind of or you can start doing let's say post matrix product state things. Now the matrix product state gives you the ground state, and you can now do start doing physics on top of the vacuum, which is typically what is being done there. And the advantage, of course, if you do many body physics now, you can use tools, especially one dimensionally like like the beta ansatz. This beta ansatz. Of course, it's, it's a, a strange thing, no? but, but it turns out that this is kind of reproducing extremely well the physics as long as the density of excitation will be low. And that's indeed true. So what is the beta ansatz? The beta ansatz is kind of an extremely good approximation as long as three particle processes, three particle scattering processes kind of are kind of ignorable. If somehow the probability of three particle scattering processes is small, then indeed the beta ansatz gets all the information. Okay? So, um, and, and, and that automatically comes out of this uh, of this whole uh, framework. So, um, but I uh, have to stop here. So, um, um, uh, tomorrow I will uh, um, um, I will not talk about algorithms. Actually, I will uh, um, I will talk about uh, um, about matrix product operators and uh, <coughs> and somehow ways of characterizing topological order. But actually, all possible aspects of matrix product operators and why somehow this. This, uh, this is an extremely rich kind of, of thing. I will kind of try to, to, to explain how to get algebras of matrix product operators and how this is related to topological order, how you can deduce onion theories, how this is related to, uh, to these string nets and all these kind of things. But uh, anyway, thanks. thanks for your attention. Questions? Yes. Uh, just can you go to, to dimensions with this idea? Yes, so uh, that's exactly what we are uh, doing. Um, so the manifold ID kind of is still com is, is indeed exactly uh, has has been worked on. So so you have a point on the manifold of maps, and um, it turns out that you can calculate the, the gradient. Okay, so maybe I should I should kind of draw a picture because it's not. So we. Uh, we found a very neat geometrical trick to calculating the gradient. So, so typically what you're interested in is the tangent plane. So you want to evolve on a tangent plane. So what you, what you want to know um, is to calculate somehow the derivative with respect to your kind of AI. There's no alpha, beta, gamma, delta. This is for a Peps times uh, psi. And you want to calculate, let's say you have your Hamiltonian there. And you want to basically calculate overlaps between somehow a tangent plane, H, and maybe also another kind of thing in a tangent plane. So you want to take overlaps between this kind of thing. Oh, the, the derivative here, H, and another derivative. So what you have is a situation where you have some kind of Hamiltonian term somewhere, and you have a B somewhere, and then let's say a B somewhere else. And you will have to calculate, you will have to take a sum over all possible ways in which these Bs can be distributed. Now, geometrically, there's a there's kind of a non-trivial thing, and again, this, this is something that 
took us a long time to, uh, to, to, to figure out because somehow we wanted to do this already many years, but we never figured out uh, if you kind of take this derivative, of course, this derivative is a sum of any time because this b can be anywhere. Huh? So there's infinitely many places where this b is. There's also, so you have to sum up infinitely many terms. But then you realize that whenever you have three points on uh, a lattice, there's always, uh, there's actually exactly two ways of drawing four corners to it. So that, wait, let me try to, uh, uh, to do it. How do I have to throw it here? Have to draw a corner like this. No, I'm probably already on it. No, it works. Does it work? Like this. No, it doesn't you work. Start I right underneath need your, your equation. Yeah. This one, yeah. this one, and this one. Okay, so what you see is that given three terms, there's always like channels that you can draw that somehow, um, so that you can vary all these. So to, to make this infinite sum, you basically just have to vary this distance and this distance and this distance and this distance. You have to basically sum up over all these things. It turns out that if you sum up all these things, you can do this using geometric series. You can do this exactly. So the only thing you have to know <coughs> is if you have a PEPS, how do I kind of basically represent these corners as matrix product states? And this you can do with somehow our method of doing the corner transfer matrix method. So, so if you've given a PEPS, we can actually, using very similar methods as I sketched before, find indeed the contraction of this whole thing with respect to this corner, also with respect to this corner, this corner, and this corner. And then somehow you just use one-dimensional techniques to sum up all these infinite sums, and in one shot you basically have the derivatives or somehow this, this tangent planes, and that's how you kind of do things efficiently. And that's, so this is explained in a paper that was posted last week. Uh, actually, there was another paper where we explained this idea already last year uh, with the same author, this von der Straten. Uh, you, can, you can find it there. And indeed, it seems that this is uh, by far the most stable way of optimizing PEPs. Okay, by using this manifold idea, when you kind of really calculate gradients and what on the kind of thing, it turns out that it's a, a very stable. You can start with basically completely random PEPs, and this will kind of lead uh, to uh, a minimum on the, on the manifold. Of course, you never have to guarantee that you are in the global minimum on the manifold. No? This is the same problem with, with DMRG and with uh, actually, there's never any guarantee with all these methods that you find the global optimum. But it uh, turns out to work very well in practice. Um, what we have learned from this is that all the PEPs algorithms that um, um, that um, um, involve um, um, kind of time evolution and imaginary time evolution, because that's most of the, of the PEPS algorithms deal with time evolution, have always completely underestimated the bond dimension that you need to represent the, the environment. So you need a much, much larger bond to, to really, because we saw this, if you kind of don't take the bond dimension, let's say, in the order of 200 or so, the gradient is completely wrong. Okay, you don't get the right kind of information of your, your manifold. And then somehow, you, we, we explain this in the paper, if you kind of use the wrong environments, the energies that you get are very, very different, actually. So I think all the PEPS algorithms using this imaginary time evolution completely underestimated the bond dimensions that you need for kind of representing uh, the environment. And this is, you can very clearly see it by doing this in this method, but actually this is pretty efficient. So. Um, and of course, once you have this, it's very cool, you can immediately start playing the same games. No? You can now start, in, once you have the ground state of your PEPs, you can also kind of look at excitations, at dispersion relations, at many other uh, things. Yes? Okay. yes? Can I tell how I get the the finite chain? Yes, but um, the, the, in 1D, the, the thing that makes it so extremely efficient uh, is, of course, the fact that you can use this canonical forms, this a left and a right, because they don't talk to each other. If you have periodic boundary conditions, this is you cannot do this anymore. Okay, so you you, you have to somehow you, have an a, you, you don't have this canonical form anymore. Right? So you have to basically always take the left and the right together, and that makes it less well conditioned. But there's no problem whatsoever to use the manifold ID on systems with periodic boundary conditions. You just have to be careful uh, with the choices of gauges because there is no unique good choice of gauges. Unlike in the system with open boundary conditions, there's always this unique choice that makes everything extremely well conditioned, such that somehow the... the so, so from the point of view of, of, uh, um, of, of geometry, working in the canonical form, left canonical, right canonical, and also further, is basically working in a coordinate system that's locally Euclidean. 
That's exactly equivalent. That's why, that's exactly what you want to do. Now, if you have a manifold picture, from differential geometry, you know that there's always coordinate transformation that you can do. And the work in the left and right canonical form, like we do, is exactly work making your manifold locally Euclidean. Okay, that's, that's what the meaning is of this. And if you have periodic boundary conditions, there is no choice, you, there is no way, there is no coordinate choice that makes this Euclidean. Again, that's, that's why somehow the, the well, it's, 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 it's more of a problem. But, but of course, this is still, I, I, this is probably the way to indeed optimize systems with periodic boundary conditions too. You just have to, to work out the equations. And yes? Um, so, is there some physical way that can, um, say, if you can one tell that if the excitation should always live on the manifold or? Um, yeah, yeah, indeed, that's exactly what I said that using, so, so the proof, okay, so if you have a rigorous proof, that's the following fact. If you have somewhere an isolated branch, and on top of that, a continuum, mm -hmm. then you're guaranteed that this, and the, the particles in this isolated branch will be well represented using this nonsense. So you can rigorously prove this, and uh, the technical tools for this are actually Lee Bronson and Bronson. So what you do is, um, so that's why this gap above it comes into play. So what you do is take any observable that has some overlap with this excitation, because that's in practice what happens. Now you have your ground state. How do you probe excitations in the, in the experiment? By applying a random operator and hoping that this operator, and typically it has some overlap with your kind of excitation, okay? because that's how you kind of get your time-dependent correlation or structure factors and all this. And what you can do now is, if you kind of have any local operator that has some overlap with this excitation, you can now use filter functions. I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with, with these Lee-Promison bars, but you can basically filter things such that everything that is outside of a certain window is filtered out. And the larger this window is, the more kind of relaxed you are with your filtering. You somehow, the, the less somehow you, you have to filter this thing strongly. But if this gap is very small, okay, like here the gap is very small, you have to use a filter function that acts on lots of sites. And that's exactly somehow how the spreading of the sites can be understood in this language. So it's kind of interesting that the size somehow of your excitation is related not to the gap, but somehow to the gap between your dispersion layers, your, your one part, your, your isolated branch, and the continuum above it. And you can see this in practice that this is exactly what is, uh, uh, what is going on. So something that I didn't tell about is that, of course, once you have these excitations, that you automatically have also a way of calculating structure factors. And not just structure factors, you can actually so use the Lehmann representation. So typically, if you have a structure factor, there's one particle contribution to the structure factor, there's two particle contribution, and so further. While using these tools, we have exactly a, a kind of a complete resolution of all one particle excitation, no? because that's do. So you can just put this resolution of the identity with your one particle excitation and see, ha, my structure factor, this is the contribution of the one particle excitation. Then we have the scattering things. Well, this is the, you can immediately say, ha, this is the contribution of the two particle scattering excitation. And this is something that um, uh, people in uh, the better ansatz community have done a lot, especially people like Jean Sebastien Co. And so they have been extremely active in using better ansatz techniques to, uh, uh, to put these resolutions of identity uh, with respect to one particle, two particle, four uh, spectral functions. Well, using these tools, we can do everything they do, but also for non integrable systems. Okay, and then, so it's, it's a much more generic, a much more general framework than, uh, than what they have. Okay, no more questions? Okay, that's done.